This is, a, this is a session outside the scientific program, and the general idea is to share with you what is the meaning of working within an international context. And we are, each one of us knows each other since 10 years for some people. So we shared a lot of experience together doing a clinical research, finally, with failure, with success. Many of us are really opinion leader now, not younger scientists. And so what we would like to, to do today is to share with you our experience and to involve you in this process, to ask questions, uh, to share your opinion, uh, to, to talk about the future of research in medical oncology. So that's why we, are, we would like to involve you in this discussion. So I will start with Karsten. So let's say, what is your experience in, uh, in international research and collaboration within uh, the Breast International Group or in the arena of medical research? Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Um, so um, I was actually starting, starting to get really involved in, let's say, breast cancer networks about 10 years ago which was mostly on a national level with the German West Group first. And we started with the international collaborations about in 2007, so a few years afterwards. And um, I, I was in a special situation from, from two points of view. First, I was a rather young person at that time. I didn't really have my... Uh, my, my board certification for pathology, I was in my final year when, when the German West Group asked for a collaboration. And the second thing was that most of the time I was one of the very few pathologists around, so I was uh, like, like looking into a, a science environment that was very different from, from what I was used in, in the pathology community. And uh, I have a sp special message for, for any young pathologists. Are there some pathologists around here? Okay, so I would I would really encourage you, you yourself, and also to talk talk to your colleagues um, to to get people involved into the clinical study field. It's a little difficult because you usually have to leave your institution for this because many studies are not institution based but but are located at the clinical clinical groups which are national or international. But really, there's there's really a need for people who would do pathology research projects in the, in the setting of translational research, in the setting of breast cancer, also for, for the other clinical groups uh, I'm, I'm talking with. And this is a little bit astonishing because as a pathologist we, we like working with tissue, but there's some kind of, kind of hurdle to really get, it, get, get the first step done, get contact with the clinical group, and they are basically all looking for pathologists who are willing to do research projects. So I would like to encourage everybody here. Oh, any question? Questions. What about one of the pathologists asking you a question, Carson? So the pathology. You are a pathologist. Please. So how did they pick you? How did they pick you as a collaborator, or did you pick them? What was the actual mechanism? <laughs> Actually, that was that was funny in a way because at that time um, my uh, there was a medical student working working as a doctoral uh, for a doctoral thesis in my lab, and she was working on COX two, and um, she was I think one of the very first medical students working working in my in my group, and at that time there was a react trial organized by by German and British groups. And I was just invited to one of the REACT trial meetings and I didn't really know um, what I was supposed to do there. And then I thought, okay, obviously they expect me to give some presentation, but I didn't have any slides because I didn't think about it. So I just made a presentation, a short statement without slides, just saying what, what the research would be and what we, are, what we are planning to do. And at that time there was really a need for COX-2 related uh, translational project. And that was the first contact to the German breast group and about like, like one year later on they asked me to, to move on with, with tumor banking. So it's basically by chance and just getting invited to some meetings. So I encourage you if there is any chance just, just make a statement as a pathologist bringing your pathology expertise. So you mean you have no mentor? <laughs> because personally I was involved the first time in the activity, so international group who 
from my mentor, Professor Aaron Goldirsch, that I was very young. I was following him in any meeting, looking to all the opinion leaders, and finally, someone say hello to you. Oh, why don't you do this presentation uh, for this meeting or for this other meeting? I believe mentorship is very important. Of course, talent, passion is an important thing to have to, to have a success. But without a mentor, I believe it's difficult. What is your opinion, Peter? Yeah, um, I, I've been told many times by my senior people that uh, I cannot be taught. So mentorship is a very difficult issue for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my name is Peter Dubsky, I'm a surgical oncologist, which is maybe, together with Alistair, one of the few in, in this little community. Um, I, th I think the title of this session is a little weird, because how can you do research without collaboration? It's, I mean, you need to collaborate. Um, my own story was, I, I work at the Medical University of Vienna, but I also work for the Austrian Breast Cancer Group. And uh, very early on, I started working in clinical research, reading protocols, doing trials. And at one point, my boss couldn't go to a meeting. And it was the big NABCG meeting in Nice. This was maybe 12 or 13 years ago. I was in my early 30s. And th this is something that you need to do. All of a sudden, you're in a room with people that you've never seen. Maybe, you know, I had seen Martin Picard maybe 40 meters in the back. <laughs> and Aaron Goldhirsch, 70 meters, but no closer to that. <laughs> and suddenly I was in a small room with that and I was supposed to have dinner with them. And I was scared to death. <laughs> and there were some really, really nice people. Richard Gelber, for example, was one of those people who were actually asking you, who are you? What do you do? And were starting to have conversations. And at one point I realized they're human. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, Certainly Aaron Goldhirsch wasn't, but the others seemed quite human. So, no, but, but seriously, it's, it's, um, you can approach these people and you can tell them about your projects and they may be much more interested than you may think. So my advice is, um, I think you need a research background, you need some sort of a background, you need a core competence that you can bring to the community, but once you know what that is, you should share that with others and you will see there's more coming back. Have a show of hands as to who has a mentor here to raise your raise your hands. So all of you have a mentors. Do you have any question for Peter? Do we have any surgeons? Yes, one. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> um, <laughs> any question or comment? Um, I can make a comment. Um, I think it's very important to have a mentor because your, your mentor is guiding you and is introducing you to um, other people. So, yeah, I, I can just confirm mentorship is important. And now, uh, let's, Sibyl, she's a woman. It's very difficult to be an opinion leader and to have success as a woman, but anyway, anyway, no we have Madame Picard, of course, I, I am talking about Italy, so <laughs> let's say, let's say, so what is your personal experience of international collaboration? Well, first, um, my name is Sibylle Leubel, I'm a gynecologist, and in Germany, breast cancer has been treated by the gynecologist, so we do the surgery part, and we also do the medical part, and um, we started doing the, the near adjuvant therapy, that's what we started off and this is very interesting and actually my first thing I did when I left medical school I worked on the zebra trial so the zebra trial was a trial comparing CMF six times with stress generation premenopausal women and I was locked up in a room with 40 files and to document this I thought, well, this is my work as a doctor. I'm not quite happy with that. But anyway, uh, what I want to tell you is uh, start from the scratch. Today we have documentaries, we have study nurses, so you don't do these things anymore. But looking back, it might sound boring, but it helped me a lot 
to see what are they asking in the CRF, get involved in the CRF, and later when I designed my first clinical trial and I designed the CRF, I know what I was looking for. And you collect, you, you tend to collect a lot of data which you will never analyze just to have a huge graveyard of data. But when you start from scratch writing your protocol, doing the CRF, and also document some of the cases yourself, you see what is really necessary. And if you, if you have a solid background by just doing also some basic work, I think it's a very important and uh, you get easier involved in also international, first national collaborations and then international collaborations. And of course, working with a group who has since 50 years one of the founding members of BIG, I think it helped a lot. We did from the very beginning clinical trials. I think I had um, a very good uh, mentors and uh, so it was maybe much easier for me than for, for a lot of other people, but still you have to pick up the opportunity and also have to work on yourself. And one other thing might be look for the niches, not what everybody is jumping on, but a niche you are interested in. So I started with breast cancer during pregnancy. Nobody was interested in it. And I started with just doing a registry and launching it internationally. So I made contact. And this was very important because then you have something you are really the specialist in. And then it gives you self-confidence. And what Peter just said, he was scared to death. But when you have something, you are really the specialist. Then they talk to you and this really supports you and will help you to facilitate your career in an international collaboration. And I remember an initiative that Professor Picard launched is Women in Oncology, because out of 7,000 members in the ESMO, 3,500 3, are women, and 60% uh, of these are under 40. It means that in the future, the leaders of ESMO will be women. So think about this. And if you consider the history of ESMO, just one woman was a president, Martin Picard. The other are all men. And the only president of the ECHO is also a woman, Martin Picard again. So we are waiting for the new Martin Picard. So it's your time. <laughs> so do you have any question as a, as a woman working in the field of medical oncology in Israel, let's say? <laughs> Please. Israel. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm an oncologist in Israel. And I think I'll speak from my challenges. As a woman, I've been very lucky because I have a mentor and she's a female role model. Um, so I'll just ask a more general question. So we come from a smaller center. And I think one of the big challenges when you're not from one of the big dominant centers in oncology is how you can form those networks and collaborations if you're not necessarily going to go on a postdoc on a fellowship. And if there are mechanisms or projects that can allow for expanding collaboration, providing support for smaller centers that have less resources, but certain experiences and ideas. And I believe now Ivan can make a comment on this. He comes from Brazil. And so what's about your experience? Uh, my experience is really a true collaboration, so I have to share a little bit what Peter said and what a little bit Sibylle said. Uh, my first collaboration started, I think, uh, 11 years ago when I sent a first email to Dr. Martini Picard. I'd never met her before, I just sent an email and then I told my boss, who she knows very well, I sent an email to Dr. Picard asking for a fellowship. <laughs> And that was my first thing. Then I had a meeting with her at ASCO. I was very scared, it was true. Two months later, I was here, working here in Brussels. So today, I'm working for 11 years in the Jules Bordet Institute as a medical oncologist. I started a fellowship, and then I had the privilege not only to work with Dr. Picard, but also to work in close collaboration with the Breast International Group, and to be responsible for a large phase three trials in adjuvant breast cancer, but also neoadjuvant uh, trials in breast cancer. So uh, I share the same things that Sibili told. We started looking for CRF, looking for things, what you need to collect, what you don't need to collect. Uh, also, we've learned from some trials what you do, what you do not do, uh, particularly in terms of sample collections that you have to involve the people, you have to involve the pathologists, it's not important only oncologists, but you have to really collaborate with the surgeon, collaborate with pathologists, collaborate with the oncologist in each single hospital. So we have trials running with uh, 
thousand centers, uh, international trials, so you can see that a crew is much faster. You can see that you can collect uh, uh, samples for those patients. Uh, some trials we did not succeed to collect as much sample as you wish, and, but then you learn in the next trials we did much better, what is the proof now today. Uh, we also think that, uh, I also think that uh, we cannot do research without collaboration. You cannot do, today is not the time that you sit in your office, on your lab, and you just talk to your colleagues in your institute, and you say, let's do it, and let's do it. We cannot do it. You need to collaborate. You need to expand the sample size of your samples. We need to expand the sample size of your trials. Uh, to test new drugs is becoming more and more difficult. You have very good drugs, and if you want to compare a new drug, you need to do much better. So for this, you need to have a big sample size of patients, and then for this, you need to have international collaboration. So, and finally, we have Fabrice. He's a master of networking, believes to me. <laughs> I met him the first time in a meeting in Cluj Napoca in Romania, eight years ago. He was talking about personalized medicine. And the first attempt, he's crazy, believe to me. And then I invited him in Milan, and Aaron Goldish told me, Who is this young guy talking about personalized medicine? He's crazy, he cannot do this. And finally, he, he published it, just published it, the Suffer 01. So, what is networking for you, Fabrice, and collaboration? Uh, <laughs> no, in fact, um, I think that was, that's, I don't know how to explain that, but yesterday it was nice. We had a dinner, and I could see that what is the most interesting for you, Richard and Martin, is that when you remember your story with your friends, uh, I can see that when you say, oh, uh, we have done Hira, you don't make the result, you just say, oh, it was a good time because we're in a restaurant and uh, we were sharing the idea. And actually, I think you are right. The point is that when I was young, I thought that the most rewarding thing was to make a presentation or something like this. And then step by step, I discovered that the, the most satisfactory thing is to have a project with friends, in fact. And remember, and it's true, in fact, when you have... Um, I, I am very good friend with Shirin, as you know, and the, the, the Panacea trial is fantastic because she's a friend, so we help each other. And uh, I, think, I think this is something you are, you are going to learn uh, step by step. At the beginning, you believe that your career is important and making presentations is important, and then you are, you are going to realize that it's totally wrong. The most important is having friends and you can share uh, interesting things. The other thing, why is important, I think, to go in big but also in other places is that, like, other activities based on performance, actually you can meet people who are a very high level. So it means that your scale is not going the same, to be the same as if you stay maybe in your hospital or something like this. So you, you change the scale of performance and this is important. I don't know if some of you are doing sport. It's the same in sport. If you want to do high level sport, you need to go where people are doing very high level sport. It's uh, something important. Network, friendship, passion, innovation, and uh, collaboration. These are the five key words. And friendship is the first one, finally. So you have to be friends with your collaborators in order to do good science. I remember the experience of the immunology task force. Each one of us maybe was a member. So uh, the big created a few years ago, the Scientific Advisory Council. We were all under 40. And we face it with uh, Martin Picard, Jose Basel, Gawish Gelber. So uh, what, have, what we have to do? And so we started to work all together on a clinical trial that never started. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we, we became close friends and uh, we shared ideas. We, we innovated something also within the big. Don't, don't forget that big started to, to work on the Aurora program following the insights of the big advisory council that insisted to work in the metastatic setting. So I believe that the philosophy is uh, one for all, all for one, finally. So networking it means to share ideas, not to be protagonists. So we don't want to be first name on the manuscript. We, we share the data and, uh, and, uh, and we work all together for one or one will work for the others. No, my, my experience is very much what you said. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm from Canada. I work in Toronto. I'm a pathologist. 
and I work in an environment where I have developed, I developed first an expertise in breast pathology. Then I met Pam Goodwin, who is in Toronto, and as a medical oncologist, being a mentor to a pathologist, that was very valuable. And uh, once you're in the right place at the right time, all you have to do is never say no, and all of a sudden you have something going. <laughs> And within two years, you will be in burnout. <laughs> I have one question for you. Who is already involved in international collaboration, either science, purely scientifically or in a clinical trial? Three. Three? Just three. That's all. Four. Can you share your experience? International, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm Nick Tobin. I'm not an, an MD. I'm a, a researcher. But um, yeah, I think the importance of mentorship kind of came through again. We were working on this project that I presented, and uh, I realized that if I'm going to run something like the PAM 50 signature, then really the best person to speak to about that is Chuck Peru. And uh, my boss was kind enough to get in touch with them and just put us an email contact and. It really it went from there, and it was very, very easy to speak with him over email and uh, very productive. I guess if I wanted, was going to ask anything, I would maybe ask you guys if any of you can pinpoint something that you really felt you did that got you noticed. <laughs> something specific. That's yes. Something I have still to do this. <laughs> <laughs> there is something that happened to me recently. I wanted to fire someone. I have a lab that is start to be quite quite big, not good but big. Um, I wanted to fire a postdoc because uh, she ended her, her contract up, and uh, I had another postdoc who came and said, no, uh, "She's a friend of us. We want you to." Uh, uh, extend her contract, and all the postdoc wanted her to stay because uh, she was uh, her friend. And all these people, they go out together, you know, in the, in the restaurant, etc. And indeed, they are working as a team. If someone is no longer in the lab, someone else substitute. It's really a team uh, of people. That was something that really uh, uh, made me think that I succeed to create, you know, uh, a group of people who are happy to wake up in the morning and work together. Finally, I fired her because. <laughs> no, uh, just when I mentioned that you have to put people together, surgeons, uh, everyone, pathologists, uh, oncologists, I forgot to mention the statisticians because in the Breast International Group, we have an extremely good collaboration. Richard Gelb is here, represent the statistical team, and I think I've learned a lot with him. I'm still very stupid in statistics, but I've learned a lot with him. It's a really privilege to have this experience. Despite it's very difficult to, to work with statisticians sometimes. <laughs> and vice versa. Because they just understand numbers. And anytime you, <laughs> you speak about clinical condition or you have to explain them everything, please reach, okay? <laughs> Now I have to speak. I'm absolutely delighted about this uh, session. Uh, the colleague over there, the, the pathologist, I think the cross-fertilization of, of disciplines, in addition to the international collaboration, is key. So if you can find colleagues, you, you learn something about what the pathologist is doing, the radiation oncologist. In my case, my mentors are statisticians, but also clinicians. And, and the thing that gives me the pleasure in my career is the collaboration, not only internationally, but also across disciplines. If you have an opportunity to do that, I'd highly recommend it. Don't be afraid of the statisticians. Either. Are there any statisticians here? No. Please. 
Maybe I want to add something else. We heard that uh, Evandro started as a fellow at BIG, and I think there are several other institutions who offer fellowship positions, and so if you are interested, just approach one of us, and I think we will find a fellowship position to learn something about clinical trials, to learn something about national, international collaboration, about multidisciplinary collaboration, we just heard. And I think, uh, because you just asked what was a, um, an event, and, and last year I had an excellent fellow from Italy, and I really, uh, it was so much fun, it was my first mentoring a young person, and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this is uh, a rule now, I don't know, but uh, it was so much fun to work with her and I think we, we profited both, uh, not only her, but also me. I profited from her and I learned a lot from her and about her enthusiasm and her attitude towards work. It's just that there is something we don't discuss, but that is important, is the core values also. I mean, people, they need to have core values because... Uh, you can be very proud of what you do if you have core value and even if it's not the high level performance. But I think core value is very important. I know B has, has some core values, other centers have some core values. I think identifying himself to core value is something extremely important. And recently someone told me that, so uh, don't worry, even if you have uh, are low level or average level, it's not a problem, but you need to have your core value and uh, that integrates several uh, things. Very good point. In a group, not all the people are really first class, of course, but if you have other people that can cover you, as, as Fabrice explained, so I am not a master in statistics, but Peter is, is a master in statistics, so that's why, that's why in the group you have something like a, a cumulative intelligence that match all the competences within surgery, within immunology, basic science. So a group is better than a single. I am sure about this. This is the final message. If you are within a group, you can achieve some results and some, um, some, something that you will never achieve alone. This is, a, this is a, an important message. Clear. It, it does, um, I think the impulse uh, team proved that. It's really, it's really more than just, you know, the accumulation of person, what happens within a team and the roles that certain people play, you know, is, is amazing and how it puts you together. In, in the, we, we really had an adversary and I think a lot of the times um, Richard and Giuseppe had to pull me back because I was going to throttle the guy from industry. It happened several times on the telephone that he said, shut up, close his <laughs> microphone. And, but, but these things really put us together, and, and uh, I think it, the protocol that came out of that was a good one. Yes. And, and another very, very practical area where it's really uh, the message that the group is more than single persons is when it comes to research funding. So from my point of view, the, the step to go to apply for European research funding was a, was a very good choice, actually, because as a pathologist in Germany, what kind of funds could I apply for? Looking at some tumors from my institution, so it's very, very limited. But once you have a, have a group of persons together from, from different countries and you would apply for European fundings, there are much more opportunities. And very often in such a group, there's, there, there are some people who know the, let's say, real famous researchers that it's very difficult to get contact to. And if you are able to, to have on a European scale like two or three very famous persons in a kind of project mentoring role in your grant application, this is, you're very, it's much more easy to, to create a level of science that goes beyond what you can do on a national or institutional level. And this was for, for two European projects that, that, we, that we coordinated now together with Sibylle, that was a, was a very important thing and I would encourage you to look for the European funding and to try to form some, some groups, uh, small networks that would apply together for funding. So you can get also money, being friends, being, <laughs> doing science, uh, good science and achieving results. So a final comment from Martin Picard maybe, yes? Uh, maybe two comments. The first one is that uh, the oncology world is a very small world, so it's, it's important to be loyal and honest, not promise things that you will not deliver, because, you know, among the pharma also, they will very quickly uh, identify you as a reliable person or not, and the same with your colleagues. 
Now, the second message is for this question. You know, people in relatively small countries, small centers, what can be done? You know, well, to start a network, you have to, you can start um, in a modest way. So, to become a network, you need several entities. So, Big started with only two groups. It was URTC, IBCG, because we trusted one another. And then we started to grow slowly. So this would be my recommendation. So you, you have to identify nearby people you would like to work with. And it doesn't, need, doesn't have to be big immediately. You see, you start working together. And of course, there what is critical is to identify a very attractive project, something that you know is going to interest the other partner, where there is a win-win that can be identified. And then by just showing that such a collaboration between two people or two institutions works, then you will suddenly find that two others are going to approach you. So then you can grow a network in your country. And once you have a network in your country, it's easier to, to come into a bigger network. And so I think it's the philosophy of going step by step not be discouraged, not, not just say, oh, I am in a small hospital in a small country. Um, and by the way, the people who are the, the greatest uh, defenders of the big networks come from the small countries at the end of the day. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you have a great opportunity tonight, so <laughs> any other question? <laughs> So if not, I thank you very much for, camp, for staying here, okay? Bye-bye. Enjoy the meeting tomorrow and see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>